All right, so hello and welcome to this program on companion plant gardening presented by Jackson County Library Services and the Jackson County Master Gardeners Program. My name is Spencer Ellis and I am an adult services librarian here at the Medford branch of Jackson County Library Services. Uh, for this program today, Barbara, our presenter, is going to be uh, taking over the screen and doing a lot of the talking. I do ask that you keep yourself muted so she doesn't uh, get interrupted. If you have questions, feel free to type them in the chat as they come or at the end. Either is great. If there's like a technical issue about sound, we'll address it right away. But if it's just a question about the presentation, we'll save those for the end and go through them all at the end. Um, with that, I want to mention our land acknowledgement and a couple other small details, and then I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to the presenter. So, Jackson County Library Services acknowledges that its libraries are located within the traditional lands of the Cow Creek Band of Umpqua Tribe of Indians, the Modoc and the Modoc Nation, as well as the Shasta, Tacoma, and Lakawa people, whose descendants are now identified as members of the Confederated Tribes of Siletz Indians and the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde. We take this moment to recognize the indigenous people whose traditional lands are where residents of Jackson County live today. JCLS is committed to fostering understanding, deep respect, and honor for indigenous people, and we encourage you to learn more about the land you reside on. For more information, go to jcls.org forward slash land. I also want to say before we get started that the views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the presenter and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Jackson County Library Services. With that, I just also want to mention that you should have received an email today with a handout related to this program, which goes into more detail about some of the plants that are going to be mentioned in this presentation, as well as some that aren't touched on here. So definitely take a look at that when you can. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and mute myself and turn it over to our presenter, Barbara. Okay, well, thank you very much for attending today. You should have also received a, a handout on the uh, PowerPoint slides. So um, in case you wanted to do any notes on those. Um, so I am uh, took the master gardening class in 2020 and I've been doing gardening for many years at my own home. Um, and I was a teacher for 38 years. And when I retired, I've been doing a lot more gardening. Uh, companion planning is something I started about five years ago and have been learning more and more each year. Um, so some of the things um, I can directly uh, tell you about how it's worked for me. And then um, the research that I've done um, is not scientifically based. So it is practical research. Uh, things that have been proven um, sometimes over the centuries to be true, but there is no longitudinal studies. There is no scientific research involved. And many of the photos that are in my presentation are um, from the Jackson County Master Gardeners Vegetable Demo Garden, uh, as well as from my own gardens. Um, and then at the end, when we're talking about uh, references, there are some that I want to highlight that I found very valuable. Um, and so we'll go ahead and get started. So one of the things that um, I wanted to look into was definitions. Um, being a teacher, I know that vocabulary is huge when you're trying to have a discussion because um, we could be talking about completely different definitions of the same word. So these were some definitions that I found from very reliable um, companion gardening um, authors. And so Alison Greer uh, stated that you plant many things, mix them up, plant herbs, vegetables, flowers, and you watch them grow. And that was her definition. Dale Meyer was more into, it's a practice of planting two or more plants together to enhance the growth and quality of nearby plants to provide maximum ground cover, and when possible, to improve the soil. So he gets a little bit more in depth on it. Where Louise Riot says, plants that assist each other to grow well, plants that repel insects, even plants that repel other plants, are all are of great practical use. And we'll be talking about some of that. And then Brian Lowell um, says, using polyculture to create diversity, 
no need for rows. You should mix things up. Plants work together to create a symbiotic environment that will require less work in the long run for you while producing excellent yields and eliminating, eliminating or greatly reducing the need to use chemicals in the garden. And that's one thing I found through uh, found true through many of the resources that I looked into. So as I said, this is not scientifically based. It's a natural practical science, not an exact science, um, especially in the Rogue Valley with our changes in climate and water uh, usage. Uh, things have trained have changed dramatic dramatically over the last few years. So this is not scientifically based research. And this picture is uh, one from my garden where I was attempting to do um, many different plants at once. And some of it worked out really well and some of it I learned a good lesson about which we'll be talking about later. So for one thing, there's no one point in history of when companion planting started, but it has been used for many centuries. And this is an example from the uh, Master Gardener's Vegetable Demo Garden uh, of them being able to plant many different plants uh, in a small raised bed. Their yield this year uh, was huge. Uh, they were able to produce, um, don't, I don't know how many beds, I think they have six to eight raised beds, and they produced over 400 pounds of produce, which was given to access this year. And the leader of that uh, demo garden is uh, Sean uh, Colley. So one of the things that is in part of the history is what we call three sisters. It's from the Iroquois. It's a planting that they, as um, far as we know, they devised and it's been used over and over again. And what it, what it does, as you can tell, is they have the corn and then they have the beans, whoops, went back too far. They have the corn and the corn provides structure for uh, the beans to, uh, to grow. And then on the bottom you have the squash and the squash helps to uh, make sure the weeds don't grow provides nutrients for the soil, and it helps to prevent the weeds. But then also I found in my research that uh, another part has been added uh, by one of our local gardeners in the Josephine County, and she puts uh, nasturtiums in the ground uh, with the squash plants, and it confuses the, the insects. So they go after the nasturtium um, blossoms instead of attacking the um, squash blossoms. And she has found that to be very beneficial. Um, she has a nursery and so she does a lot of uh, for, uh, produce and for her it's worked very well. So the reasons for companion planting we're going to be talking about what do they attack, attack, attract, or repel, because you want the beneficial insects in your garden. But you also don't want the, the insects that are considered bad insects um, because of what they do to the plants. We'll also be talking about sacrificial plants or trap plants. Um, a sacrificial plant is a plant that you know is going to be um, attracting certain bad insects 
and you put it close to um, plants that you don't want those insects bothering. And so the insects many times will go to the sacrificial plant and you just let the insects uh, bug it. And then um, there's less damage to the other plants. There's also the, um, the reason for nutrient value. So that provides nutrients for the soil uh, and it improves the soil by helping aerate the soil because of the roots. When you're doing companion planting, you're putting plants together that have roots that grow at different depths. So they help go down deeper and break apart the soil. And part of what we're doing here is we're, when we're doing the insects, we're attracting and repelling, we're making a, what we call a garden insectary. So we're making a place that the insects are going to want to come. Hopefully more of the good insects, as we call them. Okay, the beneficial insects. So if we want the insects to come to our garden, we have to make sure that we're providing them with water, uh, such as bug baths. And some of you may have seen like a little uh, dish or a pie plate, and you put it, a lot of rocks in it and some water. The rocks are there so the insects have a place to land, and then they can drink the water there. You also want to provide food for the uh, beneficials, so having the blossoms and what they need uh, to grow. And then another thing on top of that is they need to have shelter. Shelter from the wind, um, from, uh, from predators. Um, so you need to make sure you're thinking of that when you're planting your garden. And then checking out your beneficial buddies that are out there. Are they uh, surviving? Is there something you need to add? Um, especially with the water for the beneficials, once we put it out there, especially in the summertime, we have to check on it several times because of our hot weather. Other beneficial critters um, that we want to consider um, are bats that come out at night to eat insects, and they eat a great deal of them. Lizards, salamanders, uh, snakes, garden snakes, toads, frogs. Uh, you can't see on this picture very well, but there's a uh, frog sitting in that leaf. And it's one from the uh, Master Gardener um, Vegetable Garden, and he's made his home there. And then there's moles and grubs, Japanese beetles, because uh, they help cultivate the garden. But then you also want to make sure you have a sacrificial plant for them. And with snakes, um, we have garter snakes here. But what I've learned to do is I make a lot of noise because I don't much care for snakes. And I know they're not going to hurt me, but they surprise me all the time. Other things you want to keep in mind is um, some of the companion plants are said to enhance the flavor of edibles, of your vegetables. So this isn't scientifically proven, but over years, uh, gardeners have found that it does happen. And so I've mentioned that in the list of um, plants that was provided as a handout um, so that um, you can see, and we'll be talking about some of those later, about which ones, um, you know, especially tomatoes. There are several uh, herbs that uh, are said to enhance the flavor of tomatoes, um, like basil is said to do that, um, bee balm is supposed to do that. And German chamomile uh, is supposed to improve the growth and flavor of cabbages, cucumbers, and onions. 
Pest trapping uh, would be your sacrificial plant. Um, and so just having that in mind. And one of the things that several of the authors um, of the books that I read suggested is that when you're planting like green peppers, don't plant them all in one area, spread them out. So if one plant ends up becoming a sacrificial plant, you're not going to have them all become sacrificial plants. So um, spread the wealth a bit in your in your gardening. Cover crops. So cover crops are put in, um, or sometimes they're called green manure. They're put in to en enrich the soil with uh, organic matter and feeds the microorganisms and earthworms in the soil. It also prevents erosion um, in your soil. It increases the water absorbing uh, capacity of the soil and adds in the construction of it. Many gardeners will put in a cover crop uh, at this time of year and have it winter over. Um, so it's uh, adding nutrients to the soil so that you'd be ready in the spring for your spring gardening. So when you're planting plants uh, to do companion planting, there's things you have to think about. Um, Sun-loving plants may offer shade to your shade-loving ones. So part of what this picture in the corner shows is that there's piping, PVC piping going up for um, beans and things to grow, but it's going to provide shade later on for those plants that need a little bit of shade and not so much sun, especially in the summertime. You need to plant um, plants with deep roots next to those with shallow roots. So they're not competing for the same soil. The rate of growth of plants. How fast does um, one particular variety come to maturity compared to other ones? So that the one that has a quicker growth rate isn't going to overshadow the one with a slower growth rate. rate. Um, plant space and nutrient requirements. You want to make sure that you're paying attention to your seed packet if you're planting by seeds um, and spacing as needed. Uh, those plants that need a lot of fertilizer um, compared to those with light for, uh, feeding plants, you have to be careful in putting them together. Them together. Aromatic plants versus non-aromatic plants. This can be a real positive. The aromatic plants tend to bring in the beneficial insects. So if you plant them next to non-aromatic plants, the beneficial insects are going to also be a plus for the non-aromatic plants. Leaf color and texture. That's one thing that I like. Is that I like the diversity in my garden. I like to see the different colors of leaves, the different um, texture of the leaves. I think it makes it more interesting. Um, I, one of the plants I really like is um, sage. Um, and it provides the, um, the aroma of the sage when you're weeding. And it also the leaf colors can be different and the textures can be different. So it's aesthetically uh, pleasing as well as beneficial. Okay, there are some key principles for uh, companion planning that I found throughout my research that I did. Uh, one is crop rotation. This encourages a balanced level of nutrients within your soil. It disorients the soil uh, dwelling pests that may be in the soil after harvesting. 
and it'll reduce the impact of next uh, year's growth of plants if you don't have the same plant berries <laughs> to attack. Uh, and then also the various root, root depths. Um, some plants like to have a long tap roots, others like short roots. So they help tell up the soil differently. And so if they have different depths of roots, they're not competing for the same soil, but they can live uh, compatibly together. Besides uh, rotation, you also have interplanting. Uh, interplanting contains a variety of plants, uh, up to five to seven, with flowers, herbs, or um, edibles. And you're considering the rooting, but the plants are capable of producing a higher output of produce because of the variety of plants you put together. And in the plant list I supplied, there are also some plants you should definitely not put together uh, because they inhibit each other's growth. So pests are distracted from the edibles that you're trying to grow. And so they go to the flowering plants or they go to another plant and then your edibles are left to thrive and produce higher quantities. The growth rate of each plant. So when you're planting them close together, like I said before, you need to make sure that um, the growth rate will not be a detriment to the plants, but will be a positive. Uh, this particular picture is from our uh, gathering garden at the Bench of Gardeners, and it shows the many, you know, several different plants there, and they're uh, thriving, and there's very little room for weeds to come up, which makes the work a lot easier. the The soil is providing the nutrients for the uh, plants. The plants are planted in the light, you know, in the light requirement that they require. So they're doing very well. Location of plants is extremely important. Um, so you have to be aware of what's around your gardening bed, but also close to it. Um, so that uh, if you have a, a big hedge, close to it, that's going to affect the light requirement for those plants. So you have to be careful about which plants you might put in that bed. The intensity, as you can see in this picture, there are a lot of plants in a small space and they're doing very, very well. Some of them are growing up over the um, trellises that were made with um, PVC pipe, uh, the beans, uh, some of the cucumbers. Um, there's herbs mixed in with flowers and edibles, and they're producing very well. When you're putting in your transplants in the, in the spring or early summer, you wanna make sure to mulch so that, um, excuse me, so that the, the plants are protected and help with the water absorption. But as you can see here, the ground floor isn't visible. Um, when you're walking around in between these beds, and there's like three or four beds there, you can't see the, um, the ground. They, they are covering it very well. So there's less weeds and less work for the gardener. And you wanna make sure to think ahead. So if you've got, um, let's say a pepper plant that has produced all it's going to produce, are you gonna take out that pepper plant? And if so, what are you gonna put in its place? Because if you don't put something else, you are going to end up with 
probably weeds growing because you've exposed the ground level. So you wanna think ahead about what you're going to do with plants that have gone through their cycle. Flowers and herbs belong in the edible garden. I have found that to be really beneficial, especially this year in my own garden. Um, the herbs and the flowers help to bring in the pollinators. Uh, I have a rosemary and lavender um, that are probably each about two feet across and lots of blossoms. And they um, bring in the pollinators and bees like crazy. And then I also this year uh, planted my, uh, for the first time borage and it is a wonderful herb for bringing in the, the pollinators. Uh, I had bees all over that. Uh, it was wonderful to watch. And the, the flowers and the herbs provide uh, diversity and they attract the benefit of beneficial insects, like I said, and they just add a lot of variety aesthetically uh, to your garden. And one of the things I like about the herbs is that when you brush against them, when you're weeding or watering or harvesting, uh, is the smell, the aroma from the from the vegetables. And fresh herbs are wonderful to cook with. Um, the flavor is very dramatic. This is. I know we've talked about not planting in rows, but this is along a, a, along a small picket fence at the Master Gardeners and a pathway there. So they put in nasturtiums, they put in vegetables, uh, herbs, and it's a wonderful companion garden there. Um, and it's, it's next to where most of their edibles are but it provides a great ecosystem for the beneficial insects and a place for the bad insects to go if they are interested. So location, we were talking about location. So one of the things um, you want to do is to make sure uh, you provide a wind barrier to your vegetables uh, and for your insects. So one of the things in this picture um, that's at the Master Gardener's Gathering Garden is they provided a, a PVC trellis for their morning glories, but then it also provides protection for the other plants at the um, in the gardens next to it. And But one of the things you need to be very uh, careful of and I've learned this the hard way in some of my plants, horseradish as one of them, is that they can be very invasive. And they can go where you know, don't necessarily want them to go. Um, and I found this out with uh, horseradish, but at least they're easy to uh, uh, weed out. Um, but you have to, and another one is lemon balm. Uh, I love the smell of lemon balm in the gardens. I like the way it looks, but it can become very invasive. Um, so you have to be aware of that. Another thing is um, keep your wildlife in mind. So like your grasshoppers or your toads or snakes, um, they need to feel safe. So they need to have some shelter from the wind or from predators like we talked about earlier. And you wanna make sure you're um, attracting the beneficial insects, those that you want in your garden, um, the butterflies, the caterpillars, um, all of those insects that are going to be either um, helping your plants or provide food for um, the wildlife around, the birds, lizards. 
And then one of the things you may want to consider <clears throat> is um, starting with native plants. This year I planted more native plants in my uh, pollinator garden than I usually have. And I've noticed a lot more uh, beneficial insects. Um, the, they're just can be covered uh, in the flowers uh, with those. And it's nice to, uh, to watch them and see how they uh, interact with them. Some of the native plants aren't as um, aesthetically um, pretty, but if you plant them uh, on different parts of your garden, they can add a great deal to your garden because you need to remember that the uh, native plants are going to attract the native insects. Exotic plants are going to attract the exotic insects. So I love my roses and daylilies, um, uh, irises, but I don't see as much insect activity around them as I do the native plants. And uh, also would encourage you to use annuals and perennials. So um, perennials um, are plants that last more than a year. And so they winter over. <clears throat> annuals don't. But annuals, um, from what I found, add a lot of color um, to your gardens. Um, so the insects like to rush towards them. Um, like the nasturtiums. So they both are beneficial to the garden. Oops. Okay, herbs for the garden. So they act like an, um, a living mulch for the edibles, your vegetables in your garden and they attract the beneficial insects. So they help protect the, the roots of the, the vegetables that you're growing. And they act as a mulch that way. They detour the pests from making um, the, the scent on the, uh, because of the, by making the scent of the ve vegetables. And they can be used in gardening and cooking. So one of the things that <clears throat> I found in the research that I did is that there's different plant groups that have, in general, the same uh, good companions and some noteworthy information about them. So the first one was a group that consists of tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, and greens, like your lettuce. And so the good companions are the basil, cosmos, parsley, queen anne lace, and any tall aster flower. <clears throat> the one thing you should keep in mind that is that it's wise to have a four-year rotation just for the, um, for the soil. The other group consists of potatoes, beans, and peas. And so those have companions, cosmos, daisies, dill, rosemary, sweet annie. And then it's suggested that you rotate every three years and you need to make sure that these uh, particular um, plants um, the potatoes, the beans, and the peas are that you have room for hilling, to putting them in hills, or the need for rows for those particular plants. Okay, another one is the cabbage. Cabbage, lettuce, root crops. <clears throat> Excuse me. So good companions, the asters, calendulas, the chamomile, chrysanthemums, cosmos, marigolds, rosemary, sage, and thyme. 
but you want to remove any spent plants at the end of the season because these plants, the group plants, the cabbage, lettuce, and root crops, they can harbor disease over the winter. So you don't want to leave them in your garden. You want to get them out of there when they're done growing. And rotating every two to three years is suggested. Another thing to do is to plant those uh, cabbage, lettuce, and other root crops in patterns of 2-1-2 or 3-2-3 three, three, with ground cover in between. Or you could put onions, carrots, and beets around them to help um, with their production. And it was also said that lettuce grows well in the shade of broccoli leaves, which would be something maybe to try when it gets hotter and see if that really does help. Okay, the next family is consists of the squash family and corn and pole beans. So good companions would be borage, dill, nasturtium, sunflowers with a three-year crop rotation. The group with carrots, greens, and onions the companions are caraway, chamomile, uh, not sure about that one, cosmos, dill, fennel, queen's end, lace, Iceland poppies, short aster family flowers. And it's a two-year rotation. And I did find that with my carrots this year. Uh, I tried growing them for a third year in the same uh, area, and they didn't do as well. So I will be uh, rotating them. And then we have a group that consists of asparagus, horseradish, strawberries, rhubarb, and maybe raspberries. And then there's a whole group of good companions. And when we're talking about good companions, they don't have to be right next to the plant to be considered a good companion. They could be in close proximity. So from what I've read, that could be around six feet. Um, and if they do need to be side by side, that's listed in that handout that I provided. So good and bad. So on that handout that I uh, that you should have received, I went through and uh, chose the ones that um, I am. Um, I guess, particular to. And so basil is one that I have found is very beneficial. Um, it does repel th thrips, flies, and mosquitoes, at least from the, my experience. Um, and planted next to, to tomatoes. Um, I love a fresh grown tomato. So I don't know how much it has changed the flavor of the tomato, but I don't have trouble with any of the hornworms or anything like that. One thing it does say about basil is do not plant with rue or sage because they won't grow well together. Bee balm, um, I love the flowers. Um, I'm trying different colors of the flowers, the pinks and the purples. Uh, it attracts a lot of beneficial uh, insects. Um, I've put them uh, close to my vegetable beds um, and I have seen increased numbers of uh, beneficial insects. And this could very well be one of the reasons. 
and they are close to my tomatoes also. Borage is one that I first tried this year. I'd heard wonderful things about it. And I thought, well, I'm going to, to try it. And it was wonderful. Um, the plant was about two, two and a half feet tall. I had the blue flowers like you see there. And it was just covered with um, bees and some wasps. Uh, but it was a very good plant to have close to my vegetable garden. I didn't have any problem with hornworms or cabbage worms. And it's uh, still blooming. And uh, it's supposed to add trace elements to the soil. Chives is something I put around my roses, and I have for years. And I have found it ben very beneficial in helping to keep the aphids down. Um, it says that it repels Japanese beetles and carrot rust flies. Um, and then it is a bad companion for beans and peas because they don't help each other grow. Chrysanthemums uh, is said to uh, produce a natural insecticide. Um, I love the flowers. I plant them around the yard. Um, and I have found that I have less in, um, bad insects um, around the areas where I've planted them. So I found them to be very beneficial and pleasing aesthetically. Garlic um, is supposed to repel aphids on roses. I do grow garlic, uh, but it's not next to my roses. Um, but it does um, seem to do well um, where I've got it. And I haven't noticed aphids on any of the plants close to it. But it is a bad companion for beans, peas, and strawberries. Lavender. Lavender is um, has many beneficial insects. I have several lavender plants. Um, it repels fleas and moths. Um, and it can grow almost anywhere where as long as you've got lots of sun for it. Uh, it does very well. Um, I'll purposely brush against it just so that I can smell the aroma and um, the beautiful colors. There's different colors of lavender, uh, different sizes of plants. Uh, it's a good, versatile plant. Lemon balm, um, like I said, can be very invasive. At least I have found that to be so. So I'm careful of where I plant it. I still have it. Uh, intermixed uh, in my um, backyard. It does repel m mosquitoes. I have very few mosquitoes around those plants. Um, and it says it also repels squash bugs. So it probably would be a good one to put next to any of your squash plants. That's something I want to try next year. And there's no good, no bad companions. It's good for all plants. Marigolds, uh, it's one that's well known for repelling insects. Uh, one of the things that um, I learned this spring is the French marigold is also good for, the roots are good for the nematodes. So um, it's a good one to have for the nematodes. And the other marigolds, um, you have to make sure that um, they're scented marigolds. Otherwise, they um, won't repel insects because what repels the insects is the scent. Um, and then it can attract spider mites and snails. So you might use it as a um, sacrificial plant 
if you're having trouble with spider mites and snails. Oregano uh, is a good companion plant for cabbage and grapes. Um, I found that oregano is good for my grapes. Um, they, you know, they seem to do better. They have less problems with disease. Uh, this year they produced really well, um, probably because of the weather. And then rosemary. Rosemary is one of my favorite plants. It's, um, I think I've got three in my yard now. Um, I just love the way it looks and the, the smell and the flowers, and it attracts all kinds of beneficial insects. Uh, it's, it's fun to watch them uh, work, and uh, they seem to be uh, really good. At, with the other plants. Um, and because a couple of mine are very big, I use their uh, shade to help protect some of the other plants around it. It doesn't have any um, bad companions. Uh, thyme is an excellent ground cover. Um, and it's um, one I like to put in different areas as a ground cover. And they come in different colors um, and scents, and so they're um, they're fun to uh, to mix and match, um, and they spread well, um, and they winter over, and that should be good companion. I misspelled that uh, for eggplant, potatoes, and tomatoes. Okay, reference books. So I've had, um, I w had several good um, books that were recommended. And these are all very well written books. Um, and I would recommend any of them, but the, the ones with the asterisk that I have were extremely helpful. Um, they had the colored pictures. They had very detailed information about the plants. Um, they were very well written. So I would highly recommend the Companion Planning, Organic Gardening Tips and Tricks for Healthier, Happier Plants um, by Allison and uh, Greer. And they were easy to read, um, which I found helpful. The Complete Guide to Companion Planning, a uh, revised second edition, um, Everything You Need to Know to Make Your Garden Successful by Dale Mayer was very good and well worth the, the time to read it. Uh, another one was The Great Garden Companions, a companion planting system for beautiful chemical-free vegetable garden by Sally Jean Cunningham who is a professor, uh, our, uh, agricultural professor, and wrote the book. It was extremely helpful. Uh, lots of good ideas. And then this one, The Practical Guide to Garden Herbs, was very good. It's a lot of pictures. It's a good reference uh, book. And then I also used many um, educational articles from around the country, um, from uh, colleges. And I, uh, many of them reinforced what the books were saying um, and they were helpful. And one from the Oregon State University, which was one that talked about the uh, use of nasturtiums with the three sisters. Um, helping to trick the plant, the bad insects. And I'm leaving my contact information. Um, if you have any questions, um, you know, later on, um, please feel free to email me. Um, please reference that it has to do with this presentation. Um, and I'll be glad to answer them. If I don't know the answer, I'll 
find the answer out for you. So that's, that is my presentation. Thank you. I know I learned a lot. Um, I have a small garden and I'm excited to see what all I can fit in the small garden with this information. So I'm going to give people a minute to uh, type any questions they have. We did have one that came in during your presentation. So I'm going to read that to you now while others might be typing. Uh, that question was, do you put in the aggressive herbs in pots and placed in the garden to keep them from going crazy with the other uh, plants in your garden? Thinking of oregano, for example. Um, oregano, I haven't found to be in, well, mine are in, in raised beds, so I haven't found it to be um, invasive, not like the lemon balm, which I don't have in a raised bed. Um, I have this year, I started um, a raised bed just for herbs. Uh, I was trying something different out with uh, kitchen herbs. And so I do put those in a raised bed. Um, and I found it worked out well for the first year. And so I've learned some things and I'm going to change it up for next year. Barb, I was, when I put that note in, I was thinking of what happened in the herb garden at at the extension office where left unattended, it literally took over the whole garden and we've had to completely redo it. And I found the same thing to happen with oregano in my place in Idaho because I had it in a, a rock wall. And oh. literally it was out in the fields because I had a big property there. So uh, as you know, we're trying to um, limit these... Uh, plants that have world domination in mind yeah and, uh, we're we're going to be using a lot of containers for those kind of things lemon balm is on the list to be in a pot and so is oregano yeah. i yeah. just wondered if you actually planted them in among your plants or did you you know i'm thinking about possibly just putting them in pots and putting the pots out there uh, i don't know if the, how that would work but what do you think <laughs> um well I like the lemon balm in amongst my, um, I have different uh, beds. So I have uh, strictly um, uh, flower beds. And so I like to put them in amongst there wow. um, because I like when I'm weeding or watering and stuff, I like to brush against them. I like the yeah. smell. I love, I, herbs. Um, <laughs> I love herbs for that reason, if yeah. not the fact that they're so good when you cook with them fresh, you know. Yeah, and, but, I, but uh, you know, I know when I plant it that I'm going to have to be watching it. And I'll do a little bit more weeding there than I would at any some other places. Um, but so I'm, I'm pretty um, particular where I put them now because I've learned the hard way on some things. Mm. Um, so, uh, I do, you know, one thing I like about gardening is that it's never the same one year to the other no. um, because of, you know, environmental reasons or seeds or what's going on in my life or whatever. Yeah. So it's, uh, I, it's a challenge and it's something I learn from. One thing I do do that John Cobalt taught us is journaling. So I journal about my garden and what worked well, what didn't work well, you know, what do I want to try next year? So I have that all written down to remind me. And that's, uh, I'm looking forward to that. You know, it would be nice if we had a citizen science uh, organization that uh, included so that you could actually input what you find with companion planning. Mm -hmm. because um, there is so, I think the indigenous people uh, know a lot more about that than we do. And yeah. it would be lovely if it could be shared. <laughs> yeah, it would be. It definitely makes sense. I feel like sharing knowledge, not through, like Barbara mentioned, not through traditional or academic scientific options are still wonderful resources. Mm -hmm. uh, we did have one other question in the chat as well, which was what anti-pest uh, or pest resistant plants can you do um, now or getting into late fall to overwinter for next year? Do you have any recommendations? Um, 
you could probably be okay, you know, transplanting or, yeah, you wouldn't want to start them from seed now, but transplanting um, herbs into the garden uh, now. I wouldn't go longer than a couple of weeks, though, uh, depending on the uh, the weather, because you want the roots to establish. And you have to be careful. Some herbs do not winter over. Uh, basil won't winter over in our uh, area. Um, so it would depend on the herb that you want. Um, and I would check in with that. Um, and I know that I'm not sure if Len Kuntzman, is she selling herbs at the uh, October 14th Fall Festival, or is it strictly? I'm not really sure. <laughs> yeah, I know that she's selling uh, native plants through the Master Gardeners Fall Festival on um, October 14th from 9 to 2. But I would double check before I bought any herbs um, and planted them in the ground. Otherwise, I'd put them in for sing in the spring. That makes sense. Thank you. I also have a question. Um, in my garden, thankfully, we don't have a lot of squash bugs or tomato hornworms, those kinds of things, but I have a lot of earwigs. Do you have oh. any recommendations for what might deter those? They love my basil, especially. Yeah. One of the things we found at um, Master Gardeners for getting rid of earwigs is if you take a newspaper and you uh, wet it really well and then roll it up and then lay it out where the earwigs are. They'll climb inside of it, and then you'll collect them and throw them away. Um, I don't like using uh, pesticides unless I have to. Uh, I try other things first. That makes sense, thank you. Um, if anybody else has any questions, feel free to type them in the chat. I don't see any more that have happened. So just to wrap up today, I want to say thank you again to Barbara and the Jackson County Master Gardeners for being here today.